<laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We're going to, uh, <clears throat> we're doing the uh, book of Hebrews. We've been in Hebrews now for several weeks. And uh, tonight we're going to be studying Hebrews chapter 5, specifically verses 1 through 6. So I'm going to go ahead and read that to you real quick. And uh, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, tonight's passage has, has got a lot of rich information in it, but we're going to try to get through in, in a proper amount of time. I went ahead and put on the board back here a little bit of information uh, because we're going to be talking about the introduction of a character that a lot of people aren't really familiar with. I don't know if you notice that name, Melchizedek, or not, but we're going to talk about him in detail. Now, this is really just beginning uh, a course of what's going to take several chapters for us to move through to gain an, a better understanding regarding the role of the high priest in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant with Israel. Let me just say this about that. Because we have a couple of new people tonight, I want to say uh, that the overall context, because context is very important when you're studying the scriptures, the overall context of the book of Hebrews has to do with the fact that there were, there were converts of Judaism. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a special people called Israel. Let me just go ahead and go through that real quick so that we're all on the same page. See, you got to understand that before this man Abraham was called by God, there was no people of God, if you will. Yes, there were isolated instances of people that were serving God, such as we know that Noah was a man of God. The Bible says that Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of God. He was a man of sacrifice. You understand there's no approaching God without sacrifice. We need to understand that because, see, the sacrificial system is finding its way through human history until it finally leads up to Jesus and what he accomplished for us at the cross. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament sacrifices. And there is no access to the Father except through the Son. That's the word of God. That's out of the mouth of Jesus right there. But what I want you to know is, is that before there was ever a nation called Israel, there were isolated people who were worshipers of God. But there was um, in the midst of a, of a myriad of, of heathen, if you will, of unbelievers, of those that, that were pagan worshipers. They, they worshiped false gods. They worshiped the idols. They, they did not know the God of heaven. OK, and as a matter of fact, they worship the fallen one without really realizing it. We got to understand something. The Bible says that there is a real devil. He wants to destroy you just as bad today as he wanted to destroy people back then. And he will he is relentless. <laughs> he will not quit. He will try to deceive you. He will try to throw traps in your way. And let me tell you something. He's doing a good job of what he does because he's destroying people's lives left and right. And he has multitudes upon multitudes under under deception. And let me tell you, it was no different back then. And so, but out of the midst of these heathen nations, God called one man out named Abraham. And through this man, he, he, he produced a son named Isaac. And Isaac produced two sons, but we'll focus on one named Jacob. And through Jacob came 12 sons. And the 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Egypt, these 12 tribes swelled to a nation. And then on the great Passover night, oh, what a night that was. God told Moses, you tell the people to get a lamb and to cut that lamb's throat and to drain that lamb's blood. I don't know about you, but the first time I ever heard somebody preaching about the blood, it made me uncomfortable. It was all it was all uncomfortableness in the air. And I never knew really why I felt so uncomfortable. But then the woman that was preaching, it was a woman preacher, by the way. I, and let me tell you, I got saved that night. I gave my heart to Jesus. That woman preacher kept talking about the blood, talking about the blood. And listen, I was messed up. And, but yet something started happening. My heart started beating all fast. Then she said it. the blood had to be shed because the innocent had to die in place of the guilty. And what she told me was, was that the innocent 
Sacrifice ultimately was found in Jesus. And that Jesus dying on the cross as that innocent sacrifice took the sin of Matt upon himself. And because of Matt placing his faith in that, he can now be seen right in the Father's eyes. That was a good message that night. It transformed my life. And it's still good preaching tonight. Maybe not necessarily because I'm saying it, but because it's the word of God. But what I want you to know is, is that that night on Passover, they took that lamb and they sliced its throat and they took that blood and they painted the doorpost. And God said, whenever, he said, I'm about to send the death angel. Judgment's coming on the land. I'm here to tell you, judgment will hit the land again. I'm not a prophet of doom and I'm not here to tell you when it's going to happen. I know that they think I'm a fool at work. I know that the other people that I run into, they may think that I'm a fool because I talk about Jesus and I love Jesus, right? But they don't understand what he did for my life. It's okay to talk about religion, but when you start throwing that name Jesus out there, it causes things to get kind of shaken up a little bit. Have you ever noticed that? I'm telling you, throw that name out there a little bit and see what happens. Okay? And so anyway, that night on the Passover, they walked out of Egypt through on dry ground as, he, as God parted those seas, right? And then they wandered in the wilderness, but ultimately through Israel, God brought forth Messiah. He brought forth Jesus, who was ultimately the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But whenever in the midst of the wilderness journey, God told them he was going to bring them into a place called the promised land. We've just done a lot of studying in Hebrews about the promised land. It was a place of rest, that they were going to have victory over their enemies. I don't know about any of y'all tonight, but I am thankful that God has provided a place of rest for me where I can have victory over my enemies. And that place of rest is called the secret place. See, God hid Moses in a rock in the Old Testament. He said, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. You know what the Lord has revealed to me through the process of time? That cleft and that rock still exists today and it's found in Christ. You see, when you get born again, well, this is a good time to do it. When you get born again, see, the first time you were born, you were born like your father Adam. I don't know if you knew that or not. See, everybody talks about the fact that, well, man was created in the image and likeness of God. Yes, man in Adam was originally created in the image and likeness of God. But because of Adam's failure and because of Adam's disobedience, every human being that has ever been born upon the face of the earth was born from the loins of Adam, born with original sin, born with a sinful nature other than Jesus Christ, amen, because he was born of the Father, born of the Virgin. So Jesus had no sin in him, but each and every last one of us has been born in sin, and we have contributed, we put in our ante into the pot, if you will. We have contributed our own level of sin. But what I want you to know is this, is that maybe you can't see it too well because it's not that big, but listen, all mankind was born broken and dead in that, right? But God has a plan. And the plan was, was that he would send his son to die on a cross for our sin. And when you place your faith in that, God put you in Christ. And in the mind of God, listen to me, this is Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. In the mind of God, the old man that was born like Adam, born broken, born dead, born in sin, born infected, born separated from the presence of God. You do understand that originally, whenever God created Adam, he had no sin in him. And Adam walked in the cool of the day with God and had communion and fellowship with him. But whenever he sinned, he shows up the next day with fig leaves on. And God's thinking, who in the world told you that you were naked? Right. But because of his sin, the glory of God had left him. The presence of God had left him. Have you ever sinned before and felt? Have you ever sinned as a Christian? I know you've sinned. Right. Have you? Ever, and I know you've sinned as a Christian. But did you feel the guilt? Did you feel the presence of God? It felt like it wasn't really the same. Some of you would even tell me, man, I'm telling you right now, I wish I would have never made that mistake. And don't tell me that the Holy Spirit didn't try to stop you beforehand because I know he did. Because if you're born again, the Holy Ghost lives in your heart. And he's trying to tell you. See, that's how grace works, by the way. I hope we get to the teaching tonight. That's how grace works, by the way. See, grace, I, I preached a message one time that grace is for grown-ups. What I meant by that was this. If you, can, if you tell a child, do not put your hand in the cookie jar, and you walk away and you come back, where's this hand going to be? It's going to be in the cookie jar. You see, that's law. You're trying to teach someone through law, through rules and regulations, what it is that you expect of their behavior. Truth of the matter is, no man can keep the law, right? And so, but what ends up happening is, is that you catch him with his hand in the cookie jar. When I say grace is for grown-ups, I'm not talking about saving grace. No, no, no. I'm talking about victorious grace. I'm talking about great. The Bible, listen, Strong's Greek Dictionary says that the definition for grace is that it's a divine influence on the heart 
What does that mean? That means when you place your faith in Christ, and, and you are now placed in Christ, and the old man that was born like Adam dies in Christ, and a new man has been resurrected. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, you can't, we can't even exhaust this tonight, but I'm here to tell you right now that the new man that is now in Christ, you're in the, you're in the presence of the king. Here you were born like Adam with a sinful nature, but here you're born again. And according to 2 Peter, I believe it's 1.4, you have received a divine nature. So the old man that was born like Adam, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified, Paul said we preach Christ crucified. Not just a miracle worker working Jesus, not just a good teaching Jesus, but the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And if you put your faith in that Jesus, then let me tell you something, in the mind of God, the Bible says you've been placed in Christ, you've died in Christ, you've been buried in Christ, and a new man has been resurrected in Christ. A new man with a new nature. Hallelujah. That's a good word. You know why that's a good word? Because see what it tells me is? It's not all up to Matt. Oh, should Matt desire to serve God? Absolutely. <laughs> should Matt pray and ask God to give him the power that he needs to live for him? Absolutely. But Matt needs to understand something. Jesus said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. See, Jesus wants to be the workhorse in this game, in this, in this team, if you will. You know what a yoke does, right? It yokes two beasts of burden together to accomplish work. Jesus wants to be the one who's pulling the yoke. He wants you and I to trust in him, to depend on him. You know why? He defeated the forces of evil. See, some of you might be struggling. Somebody by YouTube, somebody on the internet, struggling with things, frustrated, can't get free. I'm here to tell you tonight, you can be free. As a matter of fact, you are free. If you've placed your faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, you are free. Amen? Because, see, the Bible says, according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it says that Jesus made an open spectacle over the principalities and powers in it. What does that mean? It, means, it says he triumphed over them and he made an open spectacle of them in the cross. When Jesus died at the cross and he, he broke Satan's right to sin and death and power over your life. Jesus destroyed the power of death and hell and the grave. Jesus destroyed the powers of principalities and demon spirits and fallen angels whenever he died at the cross. The resurrection is the proof that what he did worked. You understand that? Had he had one sin in it, he wouldn't have rose from the dead. Had he not atoned for one sin, he wouldn't have rose from the dead. Death had no right to hold him down because he was the sinless one that died in place of the sinful. See, the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I wanted you to understand that God has a plan. And that's really where I deviated here. And I need to be careful. Maybe we can finish the Bible study. But I wanted you to see that God has an overarching plan, a big plan. And many times we're so focused on ourselves, right? That, isn't that how we typically see the, the world? I mean, I'm not picking on anybody because God knows I've been there. And I pray, God, please help me not to be so self-absorbed. Please help me not to be so focused on self that I can't see the person on the side of me that's hurting, that I can't see these people over here that you may want me to minister to. Lord, please help me not to be so focused on self that I'm selfish and that I, that I don't care about anybody else, right? But I, want you, I wanted you to be able to see that God's got a big old plan and he pulled this one man named Abraham out and he created a nation through him and through that nation he brought forth Jesus. But also, I want you to see that in the wanderings of the wilderness before they entered the promised land, God <clears throat> instituted the way that Israel was to worship him. And it's important maybe that we do lay some of this down. God instituted the way that Israel was to worship him. And if you'll remember in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, we've talked about this before. He said, build me a tabernacle, which means tent or a sanctuary. Build me a sanctuary so that my presence might dwell with my people. And we don't have time to get into all the articles of the tabernacle or the sanctuary, but on the inside of the veil, right, there was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies 
from the holy place. And in the holy place there was a menorah, which was the candlestick or the lampstand. In the middle was the altar of incense, and to the right was the table of showbread. All these things represent Jesus. That's why we studied the Old Testament. Because God was so gracious and so merciful and wants us to get it so bad that he wrote the story twice. And he wants us to see that the first time he was preparing humanity for the advent of Jesus, right? And then he sent Jesus. And Jesus fulfilled all these things. But on the other side of the veil, God said that he was going to meet with his children Israel between the cherubim. That was two angels that sat on top of the mercy seat, if you'll remember that. But listen, the high priest could only go back there one time a year. Only one person in the whole nation of Israel could go on the other side of the veil. That was the high priest, and he could only go one time a year during the Day of Atonement. But when Jesus died on the cross, I got good news. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 51. Now, you see, I don't know if you've been watching the Bible show on the, on the TV. I have tried. To keep and, and you know what? They had some things in it that were very interesting, but I just happened to TiVo some of it. Last night, they showed when Jesus died. And they had, first of all, they had the veil as though it, had, it was made of three different pieces. And they had it wavered in the wind, and they had all these gaps in it and everything like that. And then whenever the earthquake finally came, they had the whole thing fall down on the ground. That didn't what happened. First of all, the veil, the Bible says the veil, well, not the Bible, but the Jewish historian Josephus says the veil was about the thickness of a man's hand, and it was woven, like embroidered, okay, woven, that thick, and that it was seamless. We don't have time to get into how the high priest got through the thing. We don't have time to talk about that tonight. I'm just telling you that it was all one piece of material. There was no, there was no opening to it. And, the bio, and, and that two yoke of oxen could not have pulled this thing apart, is what Josephus said. And when Jesus died on the cross, Matthew 27, 51, it says that that veil was ripped from the top to the bottom, <clears throat> signifying that the way into the holiest of holies had now been made. The author in the book of Hebrews later on will tell us that we have the right to boldly enter the throne room of grace through the veil which is his flesh. His flesh was ripped. His veil represented, his flesh representative of the veil was ripped so that you and I could enter the presence of God. See, you don't have to have a go between today. You have a go between. His name is Jesus. You can take it straight to Jesus. I got good news, good news, good news, good news. You don't have to depend upon another man because let me tell you something. One night you're going to find yourself in the midst of a mess and you're going to try to call the pastor. You're going to try to, he's going to be on vacation. And you're going to try to call old brother Matt. And I love you to death, but guess what? Sometimes when I know my mom is okay because my sister's with her, I turn the phone on vibrate. And so I'm not going to probably answer the phone. But you're going to be in the midst of a mess. Well, just remember what I told you. Good news. You got access into the throne room of grace because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Hallelujah. The veil was ripped from top to bottom. So tonight what we're supposed to be talking about is the high priest. We're supposed to be talking about the high priest his position, and his purpose. And so let's go ahead and look at verse 1. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now we're going to talk a little bit about gifts and sacrifices in a second. But let's go ahead and look at verse 2. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sin. So I didn't tell you this part, but whenever the high priest would go in that one time a year during the Day of Atonement, he would end up taking a, a, an animal to, and slice its throat. And he would bring that blood on the other side of the veil, and he would sprinkle that blood before the altar. Okay, And it would actually turn the mercy seat, is what they called it. It was the lid that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and contained therein was the Ten Commandments. It would turn that, that lid there, if you will, from a place of judgment to a place of mercy because, you see, the law was broken. And just like each and every one of you in here, and myself included, myself number one probably, have broken the law of God. But the good news is this, and we don't have time to get into this, but the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, that Jesus is our mercy seat. Amen. And so he's the fulfillment of all these things. But, but before the high priest could go back there and bring that blood, he had to bring blood for his own sin first. He was a sinner. And in these first three verses, what it's saying is, is that the high priest is taken from among men and is appointed for men. And things pertaining to God, he goes on to say, 
He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. So the idea of a high priest back in those days and the idea uh, is, is that he, because he had experienced the frailties of humanity, he himself being a human, he himself failing, he himself also having to offer sin each year, being very reminded of the fact that he was a sinner, was able to have compassion on those that he was interceding for, you know, to God for. Does that make sense? In other words, he wasn't sitting here in some lofty place, high and mighty, looking down upon all the sinners, as though, or at least he wasn't supposed to be. But religion is a funny thing. Religion gets into the heart of man and it weaves itself into the heart of man. And let me tell you something. Sometimes religion is the worst sin that there can be. What are you talking about? I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about. We can go through the process of doing religion. Big difference between religion and relationship. We can go through the process of doing religion and we can operate with some type of a false piety. Oh, I go to church three times a week and they only go one. I raised two hands during the worship service and he, I haven't scarcely seen him raise one. He's still struggling with such and such and the Lord delivered me from that quite some time ago. See, that's, that's self-righteousness. That's not the righteousness of Jesus. When I sit there and I look down upon other people and I think that I'm more holy than them because of what I do compared to what they do, that heart's all wrong. <clears throat> no, no, no. What the concept was was that the high priest was supposed to be reminded of his own sin through having to offer sacrifice for his own sin so that he could have compassion. Now, Jesus as the fulfillment of high priest, he never once sinned. Amen? Nevertheless, the author of Hebrews recently told us, because the children talking about you and me, were partakers of flesh and blood. He also partook of the same. In other words, he was deity. You understand that? He was the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence, but he humbled himself. He humbled himself, according to Philippians 2.6, he humbled himself and became a man for a purpose so that he could be obedient to the Father's will. And the obedience to the Father's will was that he would die, and not just any death, but the death of a cross. And so Jesus, he, even though he wasn't a sinner, thank God, because he was a human, because God became man. He never stopped being God. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying, and I don't want you to think that I'm being a heretic here, because that's not what I'm saying. Jesus never stopped being God. He was fully God and fully man, because he experienced the frailties of humanity. you, you got to believe that. I mean, if, 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 if I'm not telling you the truth on that, then what does redemption mean? In other words, you're saying he just resisted the devil as God? But God didn't sin. God didn't offend himself. Man offended God. The Bible says Jesus was the last Adam. He came to make right according to Romans chapter 5. Make right what the first Adam made wrong. Amen? Man had offended God, and so therefore man would have to pay the price, but it couldn't be any man. See, Adam was created without sin. The rest of us were born in sin. Therefore, it required that a man die in place, and it had to be a man that was without sin. Amen? And so I just want you to know that that's what Jesus did. But not only that, he also experienced things that you and I would experience because he was encased in this human flesh. Whenever his friend Lazarus died and he saw the turmoil that was taking place in the community in Bethany, when Lazarus died and he saw the people grieving over the death of their loved ones, the Bible says Jesus wept. He felt what sin and death caused to humanity. Have you ever felt, have you ever lost a loved one? I know that I've lost a couple of people that I love very much under tragic circumstances. I want you to know tonight, Jesus has experienced what you've experienced. He is a faithful high priest. He's not only felt the loss of loved ones, but he's also felt the temptation of the devil. And so let me tell you something. You aren't going through anything tonight that Jesus has not also gone through before you. He's experienced everything the devil could throw at him, yet he was without sin, and he offered that life in your place so that that veil could be ripped, so that you could get into the presence of God, so that his grace could change you on the inside, so that his grace could empower you on the inside, and it's for a big purpose. The big purpose is so that we might be witnesses to this truth on this fallen earth, so that others might also come into the kingdom. Because if it's about us, brother, we got a problem. If it's about us, that, that, that's an issue, right? Because there are people perishing. The Bible is in the real or it's not. Jesus said this. He said, this place that I'm talking about, the worm doesn't die. The fire is not quenched. I'm talking about eternal separation from the presence of God. 
That's another story. But the high priest was supposed to be able to have compassion, and he would offer sins first. Now, let's go back to the gifts and the sacrifices. I put it in your notes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I've already really kind of going on and on. But if you go back to the to Leviticus chapters 1 through 5 uh, in your Bible, I got it in your notes, so you can go study it later. It talks about five specific offerings. It talks about the whole burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the trespass offering, and the sin offering. All of these offerings or sacrifices in some way, shape, or form represented Jesus and what he would ultimately do on the cross. Okay, now when we say Leviticus, we're talking way back to this time frame here, 1500 BC. Okay, and Jesus doesn't show up on the scene until 33 AD. So you can see we're talking about 1450 years. Okay, but you got to understand that these things are being done every year in Israel's economy and Israel's religion. Every year the high priest is bringing the blood. Every year, every day, animal after animal is being sacrificed. Blood is being spilled. Let me, let, you want to talk about an illustration? For the, and when, if you go back and you study the whole burnt offering, what you'll see is, is that the, the worshiper, see this is how they worship God, would have to bring this animal himself, and he'd have to lay his hand on this animal's head, signifying that he was transferring his guilt to this innocent animal. That animal didn't have anything to do with his sin. That animal was just minding its own business. Yes, sir. So, Matt, is this how people got saved before Jesus went to the cross? I know they didn't go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom or paradise. But is this how they exactly. got saved? Exactly. In this sense, this is how they got saved. Let me explain it to you why. Because, see, God's plan was always that Jesus would come. And he was communicating it through all of these things that he was doing. But what mankind was responsible for was to place their faith in what God had communicated to them, which was all the way back from the garden, right? What happened in the garden? That's a great question. What happened in the garden was is that mankind, the Bible says that Eve, well, the serpent came in, and what did he say? In the day that you eat thereof, surely you will not die. Instead, you will know, and you will become as gods. When the woman saw that the food was good to eat and saw it was good to make one wise, she ate thereof and she gave it to her husband who was with her. Then the Bible tells us that immediately, well, that they saw that they were, well, it doesn't tell us that right away. In verse 15, what it tells us is that God tells the serpent, I'm going to crush your head. The seed of the woman is going to crush your head and your head is going to bruise his heel. Anybody <coughs> saw the passion of the Christ? Mm -hmm. Passion of the Christ whenever Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and sweat is coming out. He's sweating blood because of the stress that he's under. And then all of a sudden that, that serpent comes slithering up and what does he do? He steps on that thing and he crushes its head. That was what you call an illusion to Genesis 3.15 because that's what Jesus, that's what the Father was talking about. The seed of the woman. See, Eve thought that Eve thought that her, her offspring, Cain, was going to be that. If you look at the original language and you read behind some scholars, the, the verbiage that she uses describes the fact she thought Cain was going to be that. No, no, no. The promise, had it was going to take time to prepare humanity for the coming of Jesus. I know I'm taking a long way to get, answer your question, but what ended up happening was is that that was the first proclamation of the gospel right there in the garden. The seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, but not only that, in verse 21, Adam and Eve come walking out with fig leaves on. We talked about that a little bit earlier. They were trying to cover their nakedness. God said, that's not going to work. And what does it say? He provided skins for them. Now, you can do what you want with this, and you can say I'm reading between the lines, but I've gone back and I've done the study, and I encourage you to, you know, whoever else to do it. At the end of Genesis chapter 1, man and beast alike were herbivores. What does that mean? They didn't eat meat. There was no sin on the earth. There was no reason to kill an animal. They, they, they ate off the trees. Right? They ate off the trees. That's what the Bible says. I, either believe, I believe the Bible. And so what I'm trying to say is this, is that that animal, the provision of the skins for that animal was the first sacrifice ever offered up, and it was offered up by God. And it was an innocent animal that had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's sin. And it, the skins of that animal were laid upon Adam and Eve, and that was representative of the sacrifice that would ultimately come. So what I'm trying to answer your question this way is this, is that God gave a proclamation in the garden that the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of the serpent. And then he says, and in the meantime, this is how you're going to approach me, and it's through the shedding of the innocent blood 
because the wages of sin we learn in the book of Romans is death. And we've already talked about salvation history and how through the years God made this plan even more clear, right? How he showed us it wouldn't just be the seed of the woman, but it would be the seed of Abraham. It would be the seed of uh, David. And it, he would be born of a virgin. And then ultimately, the word would become flesh, John chapter 1, right? And then in, as far as the sacrifice goes from the garden, it was not a, just a lamb for a, a couple, but, but later on for the Passover, it was a lamb for a family. And then like what we're talking about now, the Day of Atonement, it was a lamb for a nation. Once a year for the Day of Atonement, the high priest would kill this animal and he would bring that blood to, for the forgiveness of Israel's sins. But listen, they were looking forward to the day of the cross. Did they all understand it to the level that you and I have the luxury to? Absolutely not. Some of them understood it better. We don't have time to get into it, but Abraham, I believe, had a very clear vision of what was going on because the Bible tells us that. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John 8 and 56, Abraham saw my day, he saw it, and he rejoiced. Okay, we don't have time to get into Abraham in Genesis 22 and how he brought his son up there to offer him up as a sacrifice. What a perfect picture. As a matter of fact, let me say this. The Bible says that Abraham laid wood upon the lad's back. 1,500 years before Jesus ever went to the cross, the Bible says Abraham laid wood upon the lad's back talking about his son. The Bible says in Genesis 22, take your son, your only son, and offer him up there on a mountain called Moriah that I will show you. But at the last minute, God stays his hand and offers up a ram in the thicket. I believe at that point in time is when God told Abraham the plan of salvation that Jesus said that Abraham knew about in John 8, 56 because he said, I'm going to do this for humanity. And so to answer your question, yes, Israel looked forward to what God had told them. Messiah is coming, number one. Look for Messiah. Put your faith in Messiah. And until Messiah come, you must, the only way you can, you can enter my presence is through the shedding of innocent animal blood. <clears throat> and ultimately, we find that both of those, the seed and the sacrifice, came together in the person of Jesus as he died on the cross, amen? So, so Matt, we don't have time to talk about this, but one day I'd like to talk to you about that same high priest that basically sent Jesus to the cross, right? And whether he was really saved, I mean, going through what we just said, he probably was saved, but he sent Jesus to the cross for some very wrong religious reasons, and there's probably some whole theory around well, that, right? I, I, that's a really good question, but let's let's understand something that along Israel's journey, there were a lot of people who once again had gotten swallowed up in religion. Right. And they weren't necessarily true followers of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus told these so same they were playing people, a part, but they weren't necessarily they weren't, doing they weren't, it for God. They were not doing it for the Lord. As a matter of fact, Jesus told them what John the Baptist first told him, you bunch you brood of vipers. Right. Jesus told him, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. The outside is clean and the inside is full of death. Jesus, Jesus also told him, you're, you're, you're liars like your father, the devil. Your devil's a, the devil's your father. He's a liar and you're liars like him. So let's, let's not pretend that this high priest was saved because I don't think he was. Okay, I can't judge his heart because I wasn't there. But what I'm saying is, is that just as there is today, people play in church just as there was then. But there was always a remnant. And the Bible tells us that many, many times that there's always a remnant, right, of, of true followers of God that have truly had their hearts cut by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that and that when they let him in and it's transformed them. I'm telling you, it's a supernatural miracle that takes place in the heart. And so we're talking about the high priest. And uh, they offered up these gifts. They offered up the burnt offering and, and they had to put their hands on that animal. The interesting thing about that animal is on the burnt offering, the whole thing, so not, not all the offerings, but on this one, the whole thing had to be burned before the Lord. You had to, it had to be divided into pieces. It's, it's kind of graphic, but it, it's in the Bible. Its entrails had to be pulled out and cleaned. Its innards, if you will, had to be cleaned. And it was also offered up on the altar. I believe that these offerings show us Number one, some things about Jesus, obviously, because they're representative of Jesus. But I think that they also show us some things that God desires from our life. Number one, Jesus gave his whole self for us. Amen. Not only that, the insides being clean show us of the purity and the perfection of Christ. At the same time, I believe that God, just as Jesus gave himself for us, God wants you and I to give ourselves wholly 
unto him. Amen. He doesn't want us holding back. He doesn't want us to have one hand in the church and one hand in the world trying to hold on. Listen, we've all been there. I'm just telling you what God wants from us. Amen. And when it comes to the innards being cleansed, God wants to let God wants us to desire for him to purge us on the inside. Only you and I, only you and God know what really goes on in our heart and in our minds. Amen. Only God and I know what goes on in my heart and in my mind. Let me tell you, man, I struggled for a long time as a Christian in my thought life. And I was far from perfect. But you know what my prayer was? God, please forgive me. I'm, I'm full of lust. I'm not right, Lord. My heart's corrupt. I need you to change me, please. And listen, it didn't happen overnight. But hallelujah, it happened. And we don't have time to get into all that. So that's the whole burnt offering. There's actually five of them. I was also going to mention the grain offering, which typically was offered up along with the whole burnt offering. It was a, it was a handful of flour, or they would make a cake out of it, either way. But the, it was a handful of flour, and the way it was described is that it had to be fine flour which describes the purity of Christ again. But you know how you get fine flour? This isn't whole grain we're talking about here. This had to be ground yeah. as with a stone. Right? Jesus is, this is, if the whole burnt offering represents the death of the Lord, then the grain offering represents his life. And he was crushed in your place. Amen? Not only that, but they added a little pitch of frankincense to it. Frankincense, it is said by scholars, is bitter. But also it had the oil placed in it. And oil is always representative of uh, the Holy Spirit. And so we see in the life of Christ that he was perfect, that he was pure. But we also know that he endured bitterness at the hands of wicked men. But, amen, the Holy Spirit flowed through his ministry. And in your life also, there's been times in your life that, you know what, you're like, man, I feel like I've been ground with a stone. You know, I feel like I've been ground with a stone. I feel like I feel like the Lord's put a whole lot of frankincense up in my mixture because you're feeling some bitterness. I've been there. I know what you're feeling. Amen. But listen, when they would make the cake, I thought this was cool. The oil was what the, was what provided the cohesiveness to keep that thing together, to keep it from crumbling. The oil of the Holy Spirit. See what Jesus did at the cross when he died in your place releases the Holy Spirit, releases you having access to the Holy Spirit. So I don't know what you're going through tonight. I'll be honest with you. But I know one thing. It's not so bad that the Holy Spirit can't hold it together. It's not so bad that he, can, he can't prevent you from crumbling under the pressure. Amen? So you hold on to Jesus. And listen, like some of me and my buddies have talked about before, sometimes God has to convince us <laughs> that his way is the right way. And you know, the Lord is a gentleman. He created you with a free will. We're going to have to shut this thing down tonight. We're not going to be able to finish this study up, but that's okay. Listen, God created you with a free will. He wants you to choose him. Amen? He wants you to choose him, but he will not demand that you follow him. He loves you too much for that. And what he will let you do is what he let Israel do. What is that? If you demand disobedience, okay. Take another lap around the wilderness. Come back and see me next year. Let's see how you're doing. You understand what I'm talking about? Some people in this room know what I'm talking about. Amen. But that's not what his perfect plan for our lives. Amen. I know that through tragedy, God got a hold of me. Through tragedy, he got my attention. And, uh, and in that midst of that broken place, I cried out from a broken heart. And I said, God, I'm tired of playing games. I want you to do something in me. I want to live for you. And I want to be used by you. A broken and a contrite spirit he will not despise. That's what the Bible says. So maybe you're listening tonight or you're watching, and maybe you're saying, you know what? I've been through that. If that's your prayer, I want to pray for you real quick. Maybe you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know what? All you have to do is invite him into your heart. To be born again, you invite him into your heart. You believe with your head that Jesus Christ died in your place and rose from the dead, and you confess it with your mouth. Jesus, I want you. Jesus, I want to live for you. Jesus, I want forgiveness. Jesus, come into my life and change me. See, it's not good enough just to believe. The Bible says in the book of James that you believe there's one good God. Oh, you do well. But the devils also believe that they tremble. I don't know about you, but that's a sobering word. Amen. So I just want to encourage people. If you never invited Jesus into your life or into your heart, you can do that right now. You don't need me to do it. Say, come in, Jesus. Please have your way with me. Forgive me of my sin. And maybe there's somebody here tonight. I just want to pray for everybody, including myself. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the plan that you provided. It's a beautiful plan. 
how you brought this man Abraham out and created a nation, and through that nation you gave us Jesus, and you let Jesus die on the cross, which crushed the serpent's head. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would give us revelation of your word. We, I pray that you would give us revelation of your plan and how you want to give us victory so that we can walk with you. I pray, oh, Holy Spirit, see, it's only you that can give the revelation. I can talk up here all night long. I can, I can get passionate, raise my voice. But my words, if they're not ignited by the power of your spirit, are nothing, Lord. So I pray that you would give us revelation, that you would change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.